We are right now looking at a flatworm. Though I would not blame you if you thought we were actually looking at a cross-eyed ghost that seemed to be awkwardly backing away from the limelight. But for a worm, you gotta say, these little guys are kind of adorable. And one of the small details that adds to their cuteness is those little triangle projections on the side of their heads. But those triangles, no, they are not just cosmetic. They are part of what makes these worms so surprisingly accomplished. The flatworm phylum is generally known as the platyhelminthes, which are distinctive among the worms for their simplicity. Worms from the phylum Nematoda or the phylum Annelida have some sort of body cavity, a fluid-filled space between the body wall and the digestive tract that helps transport nutrients and corresponds to the development of more complex systems. Flatworms, on the other hand, they fill that space with tissue and are not able to develop the same level of complexity. Now, one consequence of that? Flatworms don't have buttholes. Instead, food exits from the same entrance it comes in. We're fairly certain that the flatworm we're looking at here is a species that belongs to the genus Dugesia, a freshwater member of the Planaria family. Planarians are supposed to be super common, but for some mysterious reason, James, our master of microscopes, has only ever found them in two spots in Warsaw. And in one of those spots, the planarian population seems to have disappeared, though he does not know why. To get around, planarians glide on mucus that they produce from their own bodies, and they seem to be quite the escape artists. James found that he had to seal these slides temporarily to keep the worms from making a run for it. And watching the planarian attempt to escape might inspire a few questions. Like, for example, how does it know what it's doing? And also, what if something happens to it? Well, those are the kinds of questions that keep scientists up at night, sort of. They might not be worried about this specific situation, but since the 18th century, planarians have been captivating scientists for a few different reasons. One is that they have a brain. It's a relatively primitive one, but it is still a brain. And despite the simplicity of their brain, scientists have found that it seems to be well-organized with different functional areas. The presence of this brain has made planarians a useful model organism for scientists studying different drugs, like in pharmacological studies. But they've also been used to study aspects of other drugs, like cocaine and nicotine, because planarians seem to show aspects of withdrawal and tolerance that appear in other animals as well. So planarian brains have fascinated scientists for their various applications for us, but obviously they are also useful to the worms. The sensory neurons that make up the planarian central nervous system help it respond to different signals in the environment, like light, touch, and temperature. Planarians can use their eye spots, which are also called a celli, to respond to light. And those little triangle bits at the head that we mentioned earlier those are also involved in shaping planarian responses to their environment. Those triangles are called oracles, and they're thought to be an important factor in how planarians respond to chemical signals in the water around them, like gradients of amino acids that might help them move toward food. The exact pathways underlying how oracles help planarians detect these chemicals are still unknown, but in one paper, scientists amputated the oracles off a planarian species, and a day later, they found that the planarian struggled to find food, suggesting the oracles seemed to be involved in the planarian's chemical sensing process. However, two days after amputation, the worms were able to find food again. How? Well, that brings us to another thing planaria are famous for, an observation that goes back to at least 1814, when a naturalist named John Graham Dalyell wrote the following. It may almost be called immortal under the edge of the knife. Dalyell went on to describe how the worm seemed to be able to replace any part of its body that had been cut off, even its head. 
In the centuries since his observation, scientists have found that planarians are able to perform this regeneration thanks to pluripotent stem cells called neoblasts. When the worm is wounded, these neoblasts form an area called a blastema that allows them to essentially reform any tissue in the worm. They can even regenerate the nervous system. And of course, returning to our planarians whose oracles had been cut off and were struggling to find food, that means they have the means to regrow that part of their body too. So it was not surprising that the worms were able to regain the ability to detect chemicals in their surroundings. What was notable to the scientists observing them was that they regained this ability before the oracles were even fully regrown. They also did this experiment in planarians who had been subjected to X-ray radiation, which depletes those stem cells that make them such masters of regeneration. And while these worms were not able to regrow their oracles, they were able to regain their ability to sense chemicals. The authors connected that to the accumulation of other cells in the amputated area that might be able to compensate, but they themselves acknowledge that the results were inconclusive. But maybe one day we will understand planarians. We'll know why they have triangles on the sides of their heads and how their supposedly simple brains work and why they seem to have vanished from a Warsaw pond. And perhaps with each of those answers, what we will learn is what the microcosmos keeps teaching us again and again. That simple is in fact quite a complicated way to be. Thank you for coming on this journey with us as we explore the unseen world that surrounds us. Thank you especially to all the people whose names are on the screen right now. Each and every one of these people is a real person somewhere in the world who has decided that they want this channel to exist. They like it so much that they'll pay for it a little bit so that everybody can have it for free. So thank you so much to all of them for helping to fill this channel up with wonderful and bizarre stories of our really excellent and beautiful Earth. If you want to see more from our Master of Microscopes, James Weiss, you can check out Jam and Germs on Instagram. And if you want to see more from us, there are a lot of videos on this YouTube channel.